right. Well, welcome to Roots Reality Experiences. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Emmanuel Kim, who is a professor of Korean literature and culture studies at George Washington University. His research focuses on the changes and development, particularly in the representations of women, sexuality, and memory of North Korean literature from the 1960s to the present. Additionally, Dr. Kim is also the author of multiple books, including Rewriting Revolution, Women's Sexuality and Memory in North Korean Fiction, as well as the book Laughing North Koreans, Culture of the Film Industry. So, Dr. Kim, thanks for coming on today. Thank you very much for having me. So, I'm curious, how did you first get interested in North Korean culture? Right, so when I was doing my PhD, I mainly focused on South Korean literature. And I thought to myself, well, what about the other side? There must be something on sure. North Korea. And uh, I asked my professors, and they really had no idea because for decades now, the, the National Division has really proven this kind of ideological division as well. So they had no access to information on North Korea. The only way for me to actually tap into that resource was to go to South Korea, go to the National Library, hidden away in, in a very corner of the library was a section on North Korea. And that's where I did all my research. Wow, okay. And um, I mean, as I understand from your background, you've also been to North Korea for research as well, correct? That's correct. I, I've been there twice, uh, okay. once in 2008, and the second time was in 2015. So what were those experiences like? Because I think for most people, like the idea of going to North Korea sounds like, like, wait, what? You've been there? Like, how's that? Um, so Yeah, 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 yeah. So the first time I was there in 2008 was more of a touristy atmosphere, for me at least. And okay. I went there with a group of, uh, I believe, six people who just happened to be scholars, by the way. Not all of them, but the majority of them happened to be scholars. Okay. And they were also interested in North Korean culture. So I was very fortunate to be with that group. Yeah. And, you know, we were there for about a week doing the typical touristy sites, uh, locations, uh, monuments, and so forth. Okay. Um, I was able to acquire a few novels here and there and a few films here and there. Uh, but they weren't the typical mainstream uh, literature. Uh, they, were, they were more of the cheap paperback uh, romance detective novels, uh, which was fine, but that wasn't exactly the ones that I uh, wanted uh, initially. And so I went to South Korea, continued my research, and I found a handful of authors that I liked and a handful of novels that really changed my perspective on North Korea. Yeah. Okay. And so the second trip, I, I told myself, if I go there again, the second time, I want to meet some of these authors. I, w I wasn't able to meet a multiple uh, number of uh, authors. I was only able to meet with one. But that one person really changed my life. So, uh, and I loved his novels. So I went there in 2015 and I spent three days interviewing, eating, uh, playing ping pong with this guy. And it was just a lot of fun, right? And I got wow. to learn a lot about North Korean literary culture, the way they write, the way they get censored. Um, and all kinds of interesting stuff. So that was a very invaluable time. Yeah. Now this is, I think for a lot of people listening, this is really interesting because the way you describe it, it sounds like a casual research trip abroad. Um, yet for most people, I, as I understand, it's, it's quite hard to actually go to North Korea, correct? Like you have to go through a special like tourist agency in China or something, or what's the, what's the yeah. traditional way of being able to get there? Yeah, yeah. So you can actually find these agencies online. And okay. you can contact them and they will be more than helpful. Um, and so you just set up an, you just arrange a, a time to um, go on this tour uh, because they have different blocks of times that they go. And, you know, you find the one that most fits your schedule and you apply. Um, you have to provide a few documentations. Um, and if you have a pretty clean background, right? In other words, you were you weren't uh, part of, or you weren't working for the government or the CIA specifically, because the North Koreans will do a background check on you. 
And if they sure. find something a little fishy, they're not going to allow you into their country. So right. as long as you have a pretty clean slate, um, yeah, going in isn't much of a problem. And yeah. in fact, many Americans have gone uh, at this point. So it's it's no longer so much of a novelty as it used to be, I, don't know, I guess, back in the 90s. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I, I guess it's, is it still as open as it was? I know that after like a few people were kind of, you know, held hostage at one point in time, there is some uproar about, hey, don't go there. Um, is it kind of reopened again then for people at this point? Or is it closed? No, no, the situation is no. The situation is not good. Um, okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So my advice to your listeners is, yeah, let's stay away from North Korea for now. Right. <laughs> and uh, let's have your travel destination somewhere else. So no future vacations there. Um, no. not, not a great place to take the family. Yet. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. So what is the atmosphere like there? That, I mean, I, I suppose that for the most part, like it's, it's kind of a, when you're, what, with what you're presented with when you arrive, it, it's kind of this uh, sort of fictitious atmosphere of North Korea then. And are you like being closely monitored every step of the way? Um, what is that like? And especially because of your second trip, it sounds like you had a, a little bit more access to normal parts of North Korea. Compare and contrast those for people. Right. So arriving in North Korea would not be like any other travel destination. You're not going to land in the airport and catch a cab to your uh, hotel and start uh, you know, looking up online which restaurants to hit first and which uh, tourist sites to visit. It's not going to be like that. In fact, it's going to be led by one or two North Korean tour guides. Now, they're called guides, but what they really are are uh, minders. They're the ones who follow you around. They're the ones who watch you and in some cases watch you very carefully. Okay. Um, yeah, so... You know, I call them chauffeurs, right? Because they are at my beck and call at any time of the day, right? So I can mess yeah. around with these, with these guys and say, oh, yeah, you know, I want to go here. And then he'll rush over to my hotel and so forth. And he'll be there. Um, you can call them minders. You can call them whatever you want. Bro, but you're going to have yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. You're going to have them throughout your trip. That's a, okay. that's a must. So it's not like any other trip or any other country. Um, other than that... Usually they'll have the whole itinerary set out for you, right? So there are really no surprises. Um, but, you know, they go over it with you uh, beforehand and see if it's okay. And if you want to change it, that's fine too. Um, as long as it's not a wild, uh, you know, adventure outside of uh, the capital city, um, right. as long as it's not too demanding, I think a lot of these tour guides will be, uh, you know, um, they will allow some some changes, sure. Okay, interesting. And so, when you like arrive there, is there kind of a questioning process at all, or do they like? No, ask no, you there's no questioning process. No, no. Okay, they're so, just like, hello. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they're waiting for you at the airport, right? Uh, with like a sign, you know, uh, "Are you Mr. Kim?" And so forth. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say, hey, yeah, I'm I'm Mr. Kim, right? And uh, you know, the, the 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 minder will lead me out of the airport and get me in a car. Uh, so I have my own car. And we would drive around anywhere I want to go in, in the capital city. So um, the second time I was there, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of lived like a king. So I, I said, hey, I want to go there. And he'll drive me there. I want to okay. go over here. We'll go over there and so forth. So uh, the only time we couldn't do that was on a Sunday when the driver uh, was – was off that was his day off okay interesting so yeah. was what was the uh like i mean what were you being presented with when you were there what what were you seeing and you know were, were there any kind of interesting questions were people curious about you and your life or were they just kind of like this is you know this is north korea All right <laughs> yeah 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 so so they already knew much about me Okay. So there wasn't really much questioning uh, for me. Like they didn't ask me any questions. Okay. Um, and they already knew all the books I wrote that I've written. They've already known. They knew everything. So, so they like, studied you beforehand, then? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. They did a, bra- a background check on me, right? So, okay, a serious um, one, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially, especially if if um, you know if you've published and you're a somewhat of a public figure at that point. Okay. In other words, in other words, if they can find you online, yes. uh, that means that means you're a public figure. So. Um, they were able to tap into all of my uh, articles that I've written, books, and so forth. So they already knew my academic position, and so uh, there wasn't much asking. Uh, you know, they didn't ask me any questions. Now, um, unlike the first time I, I went to North Korea, the second time was more hanging out at coffee shops, hanging out at bars, um, and just chatting with the locals and my minders. Um, of course I spent three days with my author. So that took up a big chunk of my trip, uh, my, my second trip. But yeah, I, I told my uh, guide, I said, look, I've already been here. I've already seen all the sites. So I don't really need to see all the sites again. So let's avoid that. I just want to, I just want to be with the people. Right. So let's go to a coffee shop. Let's hang out. Okay. He thought that was weird, but we hung yeah. out at a coffee shop and, uh, yeah, you know, we spent so many hours there. We went to some museums that I hadn't gone to. So that was pretty cool. Um, but most of the time, yeah, we were just chilling at different restaurants. I, I think uh, we went to so many restaurants and we tried so many different foods in, in Pyongyang. Um, and, you know, some, some were delicious, some were awful. So, you know, I, I, got a, I got a pretty good idea of which restaurants were good at that. So was like a restaurant atmosphere in North Korea, is that like, anywhere else uh yeah what type of people it was just like anywhere else yeah what, what were the what were the like the, the people like was this like a like a special like a sort of an upper class sec, you know situation at restaurants or was no, it kind of no, I'm not, any not random person yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely okay. yeah yeah just and so, anyone um, and, and they were allowing you to like get access to these people and they weren't like concerned you like having conversations but i guess you were being chaperoned at the same time so yeah so I, yeah, so I, I wasn't going to approach any family at a eating at a restaurant because that's just weird, right? I mean, right, can you imagine right. if you're eating at like Chili's and all of a sudden some <laughs> random foreigner came up to your table right. and said, "Hey, can I ask you a few questions about <laughs> yeah. I don't know Indiana?" And you'll be like, "Who who are you?" Right? <laughs> okay. um, so I avoided that at all costs. Um, yeah. What I did was uh, like I would talk with the bartender if I was sitting at a bar. Okay. I'll just yeah. start talking, you know, start a, a conversation with the bartender, which is pretty normal anywhere I think in the world. Okay. Right? I mean, that's sort of that that is kosher, right? In any um, sure. setting, right? Um, you know, I was at a coffee shop. There was a barista there, and I would ask the barista a few questions. Um, but you know, uh, questions related to coffee, right? Okay. <laughs> Not like you know, hey, where do you live? You know, yeah. Like, <laughs> I what, what's I your view on that personal... political situation here? Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. So as long as they were sensible and reasonable questions within Casual. the context, yeah, 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 those were allowed. Um, <laughs> so you know, you just have to kind of have common sense when you're at, uh, in North Korea because when you sort of venture into the hey, I, w- I want to pry into your private life, I want to pry into your politics. That's when right. you get into trouble, right? And yeah, you want to avoid that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. you can still learn a lot, obviously, just from talking to people casually, because you get to pick up on, you know, their lives a little bit through that lens, I think. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. For example, like, uh, you know, how, how long have you been a barista, right? Yeah. Um, that's interesting, right? And, and you know, how, how were you taught? You know, what, did you have to go to school to, for all this, right? And how long yeah. was the schooling? And, you know, things like that is, is really interesting, right? And, and same with the bartender, right? As she's mixing a drink. You ask all these questions and she's more than happy to answer all those questions, right? As long as they're not private and you're crossing the line, right? Um, I think any bartender would be more than happy to chat with you, right? So, sure. you know, it, it's, it really seemed like a normal everyday situation. It's just that I was in Pyongyang. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, obviously when a lot of people think about North Korea, there's a, a long history of propaganda there. Um, how prevalent is the propaganda when you're in North Korea? Is it just like everywhere or is everywhere. it everywhere? Just... It okay. is ubiquitous. Okay. <laughs> it is. It is in your face. It is flashing with neon lights. It is uh, blasted through the speakers. Um, I mean, there is no getting away from uh, what we would call propaganda. So, so we have to be somewhat 
careful of how we categorize and and um, characterize propaganda. So coming from the West, especially the United States, we would probably call all of the all of the visualization and the optics as propaganda. Um, but at the same time, it can appear to be like commercials. Mm -hmm. right? So you'll see a billboard and you'll see, I don't know, the latest car that's out, right? And they'll say, oh, here's the latest car. Um, you know, let us purchase this car to support the national economy, right? So they would always add a little bit of the national part, right? Okay, yeah. And, and we might call that propaganda. But, and of course, you know, here in the States, we would never, we would never say, uh, you know, purchase a Ford to help our national economy. I mean, right. of course, we would never say that, right? Um, but the context of it is what matters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so again, it, it appears to be propaganda to us, but to them, it's just everyday life, right? Right. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with purchasing this car to support the national economy. Right? Sure. So, um, you know, again, propaganda in everyday life sort of go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. But I guess the it's the the question then is just like to what extent like how strong is the propaganda like okay a car commercial versus like we you know we are the greatest you know, we are the greatest ever or uh, our leader yeah. is the greatest ever you know big difference yeah. and yeah 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 so so for example um, you'll see slogans so political slogans written in various forms like banners. Um, or carved into like a statue. Okay. So one of the more common uh, propaganda slogans would be, the great leader Kim, Kim Il-sung will live with us for eternity. You know? okay. um, he is our eternal leader, right? Yeah. Uh, we will never forget our uh, leader or we will never forget our soldiers or you know, something patriotic like that. Sure. You're gonna see a lot of that. Um, on, on top of apartment buildings, you're going to see a few words that say, mm, roughly translated, we are one, um, we are united as one nation or something of that sort, uh, written on top of the apartments. Okay. And it looks a little strange and it's a little jarring at first, but let me tell you, after a few days, you don't even notice it. You don't even notice it. You know, all these posters, propaganda posters that, you know, if you Google North Korea propaganda posters, you're going to get a lot of visualization, right? Sure. And when, you, when you're in North Korea, you're going to see all of that visual, you know, a, a, as a reality, right? Yeah. But by the end of the second day, beginning of the third day, you don't even see it. Yeah. It's, it, uh, because, again, it's so part of everyday life that... You know, it's okay. I'll give you another example. So there's a there's a all female um, rock band in North Korea. They are the hottest commodity right now in North Korea. <laughs> they are they are the equivalent to the Korean K-pop movement that's happening right now. Okay. BTS. Wow. They're the they're the equivalent to BTS, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, their music is blasted pretty much in every coffee shop, every bar, every department store, right? Um, in my hotel lobby, their, their songs are blasted, right? There's no escaping this group, right? And I thought to myself, this is pretty insane, right? I mean, how could they listen to this group 24-7? Okay, well, if you've ever been to Seoul, any department store, any restaurant, any bar you go to, K-pop will be blasted, right? Of course, given, granted that it's not one group and, you know, K-pop, there are hundreds of different sure, groups sure. Uh, in, in, in Korea. So, you know, you're going to get a variety, uh, but nonetheless, it's K-pop, right? You're not going to get, I don't know, I mean, unless you go to a specialty uh, bar uh, that, you know, serves like, I don't know, New York blues, jazz, or something. You're not going to get that music. You're you're, you're going to get K-pop, right? So it's basically like that, right? And so if you understand South Korea uh, and the K-pop scene, then North Korea's this this all female rock band scene is very understandable. 
Sure. Interesting. Okay. So that's that, that female rock group, that's their main thing. So do they like sell CDs and stuff of the group? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like any, it's like any other group. Um, I haven't seen them. Uh, I haven't seen their CDs uh, um, at any store because I, I'm not sure if North Koreans listen to CDs. Uh, they just listen to it over their phone these days. Okay, so right, the sort of more modern equivalent. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And um, interesting. Okay, so is there what are like the lyrics of songs for North Korean rock? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The lyrics. A lot of people. I mean, we would consider it laughable, right? Um, Okay. Uh, one of my yeah, one of my favorite songs is "Let's Study." Okay. Let's study. So the chorus is all like, you know, "Let's study, let's study," right? And you're you're thinking, what do you want to study? Right? What are what, what like algebra? Like you want to study? Like what what do you want to study? Right? And essentially, it is let's study the great works of our leaders. Oh, okay. So the, there yeah, so the books that they've written. Yeah, there you go. Right. So, so <laughs> if you want your dose of propaganda, it's right there. Right. Back to Let's the main study. theme. Yeah. It's like... Yeah. 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 All right. But let me tell no you, wonder there's the so reason. Popular. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Now, now the 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 song "Let's Study," uh, the lyrics might be obviously you know, heavy with propaganda, but one of the reasons I like that song so much is it's really catchy, man. It okay. Is, okay. It's a catchy song, right? So. Um, I, I don't even listen to the lyrics. I just listen to the melody. And, sure. um, you know, after a few times, uh, you know, I find myself humming, right? And, and, and kind of going, hey, you know, wh why is that song stuck in my head? Because it's so catchy, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah you know? um, but they, yeah, they, they have tons of songs like that. Um, so lyrics that uh, glorify um, nuclear testing. Yeah. Songs that glorify, obviously, um, the military, uh, the people, socialism. Um, you know, so you, whatever you want, they'll have it, right? Um, yeah. They're not going to have love songs, you know, like, oh, baby, I want you. They're not going to have anything like that. No right? Backstreet Boys. And, um, no Backstreet Boys. <laughs> I want it that way. No, no. They're, the only way that they want is the way of the leaders, right? That's all they want, right? Um, so yeah, you're not going to have anything that resembles, you know, America's, um, you know, love songs or any of that sort. You're, if you do get a love song, it's a love song, you know, for the country, for the, the leaders. Right. Um, yeah. So it's going to take a few years, I think, for them to come out with an actual love song. Now, now having said that, do I think that they do actually have love songs for one another? Yes. It's just not, um, it's not condoned by the party. So okay. it's not publicized. So it's not like but a mainstream thing. It's okay. not the mainstream thing, right? Okay. But at the very local, at a very individual level, I totally think, and I know that they have love songs for each other. Interesting. Okay. So what was like from all your research and experience traveling there, what were some of the strangest like propaganda that you witnessed? Because I know like online you'll read things like, oh, you know, something like the, you know, one of the leaders of North Korea invented the burrito or, you know, or, or is great at golf, uh, you know, very superhuman, you know, qualities. Uh, what were some of the things that stuck out to you? Like, wow, that is one well, of the strangest things. Yeah, but. Uh, I'm not sure about strange because, you know, what, what, once you study North Korea, you read about it, you, you research it, and then you go to North Korea, you already have a huge, like, database of okay. strange ideas, strange right. things. So so nothing will catch you off guard. Or, yeah. um, but there was one anecdote that my guide told me that I thought was somewhat entertaining. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not sure if your audience will be able to watch this uh, podcast. Are, are, are they able to yeah. watch yeah. it? Yeah, they'll be able to watch it, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so the anecdote is, well, coincidentally, Matt, Madeline Albright passed away like a week ago, right? So yeah. um, when Madeline Albright visited North Korea and she met with the dear general 
Kim Jong Il, the son of Kim Il Sung, the father of Kim Jong Un, he Kim Jong Il wanted to test Madeleine Albright's wit and sense of humor. So he asked uh, Madeleine Albright, "Do you know that I have sixteen fingers?" Madeleine Albright said, "Whoa, that's impossible." How is, it, how is it that you have 16 fingers? And Kim jong Il said, well, I have four fingers here. And then I have four fingers here. Well, in the middle is, a yeah, I'm not sure if I'm doing this correctly, if, you're, if my camera can pick this up. Okay, so the X in the middle is multiplication. So four yeah. times, four is 16 and he started to laugh and madam according to the guide madeline albright was amazed by kim jong-il's you know sense of humor wit and was completely bemused um, so that's the kind of propaganda that i heard from my guide um yeah, uh, that's the anecdote. Now, whether that's a true uh, story or not is beyond me, and I, I don't, I don't care to delve into uh, the veracity of that story. But nonetheless, uh, the idea is: look how clever our dear general Kim Jong Il is. Right. right. So um, there, there hasn't been a story yet that I've known or that I heard yet um, about Kim Jong Un, uh, especially after meeting with uh, Trump. So. Yeah. You know, I'll be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if uh, the the state comes up with some interesting anecdote about their meeting. But we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That would be that would be interesting because that was that was yeah. quite the show for sure. So. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so, but generally speaking, you do. It seems like it's a popular thing then for North Korea for their leaders to have lots of this kind of. Uh, mythology or, or you know these incredible stories about their abilities and stuff like that and and i guess that's just kind of normal uh just kind of a, a, a normal part of the atmosphere there then right right so um the question really is do the people believe it yeah that's what i was actually just gonna ask is how do they respond to this and yeah. live with that yeah 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 so do they actually believe that their leaders are capable or have done these fantastic feats? Um, did they truly, you know, invent this? And are the North Koreans gullible enough to believe that? I'm not sure because it's impossible to obviously sort of take a survey or speak privately to the North Koreans. Um, but according to defectors now, they have a pretty interesting take on all of this propaganda. And according to the defectors, they say that it's, it's likely that North Koreans do not believe everything the party says. In other words, they, the, the North Koreans know how to decipher and decode what is true and not true. Right. So I don't know how they do it. It's just that's what defectors say. Right. So the party will say the party will say something like, oh, um, recently our leaders you know, met with this leader from another country. Now, that's true. They might right. have met with a leader from a different country. But did they say the following? They're going to have to decode that right? Yeah. and, and right. decipher. So so that's what the North Koreans are capable of doing. Um and they know how to filter out what's true and not true. So I yeah. think that's interesting. And, you know, when they see all these propaganda posters lined up uh, along the walls and all these murals, all these statues, um, I, will, I will guarantee you this. If they see a statue as they're walking by, they're not going to bow to it. They're not going to be like, oh, you know, they're not going to Right. That. It's just everyday kind of part of the landscape of North Korea. Sure. Right. So, you know, after a while, I mean, you ask... Um, you know, New Yorkers, are you in awe of the Statue of Liberty or the Empire State Building every time you go by it? No, 
right? New Yorkers right. could care less about the Empire State Building after a while, right? Yeah. So um, it's just, you can tell who the tourists are, who the ones, you know, the ones who are taking photos of the Empire State Building, right? So, yeah, so, um, yeah I mean, after a while, uh, if you live there and you experience it every day, it's, it's not even gonna register, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, so like the, the videos and stuff that come out in North Korea, would you say are, are highly staged in terms of like the applause and stuff, everything, or people generally speaking, know like I need to do this in this situation. Um, yeah, what's that's yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think the ones we see uh, in our media, um, you know, we we can say that they're staged, um, but that's that's a funny thing. Uh, do they purposely put them there and say start clapping? Uh, yes and no. I think. It's hard to tell. Yeah. Um, I, I would, I guess, it would depend on what the event is. Right. Um, so, uh, for example, I mean, do we find it strange that you know, if, if you've ever been to like a, 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 a recording of a late night show with Jimmy Fallon, you know, they do have a guy who says who raises up a sign that says sure. "clap" and everyone has yeah. to clap and everyone has to cheer, right? So, I mean, yeah. that's pretty artificial if you ask me right so yeah. uh but if you don't if you don't have that person who holds up the sign clap or cheer uh then the the whole show might be a little dull right so yeah. you, you're gonna have to have some you know the audience cheering and clapping in order to get the momentum of the laughter going you know because if, if you have others laughing surprisingly you start to laugh when you watch the show as well so yeah. you know if we think of it like that then the staging, the so-called staging of North Koreans uh, in, in media or whatever their state media shows isn't entirely surprising. Um, right. You know, because it does sort of, you know, provoke the viewers to have that kind of response, right? The emotional response. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, when we say staging, we, we would have to look at the context of what that means, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Do you think that uh, North Koreans, generally speaking, have a like a strong affinity for their leaders? I think some do. Okay, yeah. some do, and, and some are just kind of going with the flow, kind of. Just, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I'll, I'll be. Uh, I know for a fact that the majority of the North Koreans hated Kim Jong Il. Okay, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a that's a pretty well known fact. Okay. Um, and while he was in power before he died. People just went along. Uh, there are so many. There are so many jokes about Kim Jong Un by the by the citizens, right? I'm mean, we're talking really? about like, oh yeah, 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 like like how ugly he is, how fat he is, how uh, short he is, how insecure he is. Um, all of these jokes, right? So, wow. um, you know, but that that that's not the first time I've heard um, people make fun of Kim Jong Un. Um, some people are nostalgic and they have fond memories uh, if, if they're old enough. They yeah. have fond, fond memories of their first leader. You know? But yep. they have a good memory of the first leader, although he was bad as well. Um, they have a fond memory of the first leader because the second leader, the son, was so bad, right? So yeah. if, you know, if, if you have a worse leader, then all of a sudden the first leader looks really nice. Right, so, yes, yeah. You know, we see this yeah. all the time, all over the world. All the time, yeah. all the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even with our presidents, right? Yep. Um, you know, you have this nostalgic, uh, you know, memories of the previous administration, right? So, um, yeah, and now with the current leader, um, I don't think, I think the majority of people who live in the, the capital city um, have a pretty positive view of the current leader. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because he, he's trying to promote change. He's a young guy who who wants to do this and that. He's experimenting with this and that. Um, and I'm I, I I really want this guy to promote more change if possible. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But, I mean, that's the thing, I guess, with authoritarian governments is that. You know, you know it's going to be authoritarian from one layer to the next, but if someone can help liberalize it a little bit more and open it up yeah. a bit, you know, that's progress, even if it's not yeah. for, you know, nations that are <laughs> democracies, um, you know, that's, that's still considered like, hey, that's a step in the right direction for us. So, um, Absolutely. I mean, look, um, when I was first there in 2008, 
uh, I guess only the elites, uh, the wealthy in the city uh, walked around with cell phones. Okay. In 2015, like 90%. And then my colleagues said, now it's like 100%, right? Uh, everyone is walking around with a phone. Uh, minus, minus the little kids, right? right. Uh, I'm talking about uh, adults. Right? Yeah. So so the next step, and, and by the way, they're getting all their information in their phone, right? Um, through their phone. Uh, they are texting each other. They are you know, paying each other through their phones, with their okay. phones. They have like this payment system, like a Venmo. Okay. Um, so it's just a matter of time before they get access to the internet and um, they can, you know, finally do what we all do. Yeah. Okay. Well, that would be good. All right. Yeah, that would be good. So, it, <laughs> you know, just, you know, we, we, we just need to be a little patient. So again, um, I think the, the, the current leader, um, I think he really wants that. I think it's the old cabinet members who don't want that kind of radical change because they know that their power will be very limited. Yeah. And, you know, this kind of sudden radical progressive change um, is too much for you know, a country like North Korea for now. Yeah, sure. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it gives a little bit of a different different side of it instead of just looking at the sort of the military rhetoric all the time, but what's actually happening there in society and how it's changing. Um, yeah. I think some of the interesting things about your research is that you try to get, from what I understood, you try to get sort of beyond the propaganda and look at the normal day-to-day -day life and, and show these like real natural human experiences that people could relate to anywhere in the world. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that and like, you know, sort of giving a glimpse to of what North Korea is like but sort of behind the curtain? Yeah, absolutely. So I started with literature and then I moved to films. And, you know, one of the striking things about literature, or at least a, a pattern that I saw, was this kind of mm, individual desire uh, for one's own sake and not necessarily for the, uh, for the state or for the leaders or for the uh, country. Um, so typical North Korean literature uh, would be the main characters praising the leaders, the state, the party, uh, having this kind of patriotic um, uh, sensibility towards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but then, you know, as you read through a lot of this different types of literature, you come across ones that don't have that necessarily. Um, or if they do have it, it's only in passing, right? So it's not the crux of the story. It's not the main point. It's not the driving point. It's the more of an afterthought, right? Um, and, the, and the focus really is on me, on me and my partner, me and my, uh, you know, my work colleagues, my me and my community and so forth, right? So um, I was able to relate to those stories a lot more. And the more I looked into those stories, the everyday story, right? The, the banal stories, right? The ones that uh, talk about going to work and getting, getting into an argument with my coworker, getting into an argument with my boss, something that we all can relate to, right? Um, getting into a, a fierce, like, you know, argument with my wife or with my husband or whatever it is. Uh, difficulty of raising my teenage boy, right? So um, w when I started reading fiction, that focus on that, a whole new world opened up, right? And I thought, wow, their day-to-day -day life is very much like ours. Yeah. Right? So that's when I, you know, when, once you get past the, um, the, the, the passing statements of these uh, characters who glorify the country, right? Uh, once you get past that and you sort of roll your eyes, all right, all right, let's get past yeah. that. <laughs> right. Uh, now you see a different world and, I was so drawn into that world. And I translated a novel uh, that I thought was very indicative of this world that we all need to see. It's called Friend. Uh, you can look it up on Amazon. And for me, again, uh, it's the novel is about divorce and it deals with, you know, domestic violence. It deals with, um, you know, divorcing couples who have, who neglect their child and so forth and, you know, arguments with their coworkers. 
again, very day to day, uh, um, you know, experiences, right? Uh, is there a glorification of the the, the country, uh, the party? Yeah, in passing, right? But it's not the main point of the novel, right? So, um, so far, a lot of people have had very interesting responses to that novel. Um, are you going to escape the propaganda? No, you can't. Not in North right. Korea. It's it's built into the system, so you're going right. to encounter it at one level or another. The difference is what level are you going to experience it, right? Are you going to yeah. experience it like a heavy dose? Yeah. Um, or are you going to experience it with a light dose? That's the only difference, right? So uh, you're not going to get away from it. You're not going to find novels that criticize the leaders. Um, you're not, or at least the, the ones that are uh, publicly published, right? The ones you can find at bookstores. You're not going to find those... Uh, any, you're not going to find any works that criticize the leaders or the party. Yeah. Um, but if you, but if you want to find novels that criticize each other, that criticize the social uh, issues, yes, you're going to find a lot of those, and that opens up you know a whole new so, world. So, yeah. yeah. So it's not like kind of like the more subtle criticisms of society that. Yeah. If one, you know, I guess, kind of reads between the lines, you could say like, well, this is, you know, kind of the leadership's fault, but, you know, it, it's not like a, a glaring attack or something. No. Because no. that's, a, yeah, that's exactly. a super common thing, I think, historically, in like, you know, Soviet Union and, you know, various other places to have these, these subtle little kind of digs at society, which are reflective of the top, but not a yeah. direct hit, you know, at them. That's right. That's right. And, you know, once I moved over to the comedy films, that was a whole new world, right? So, um, you know, with, with literature, it was a little more serious. It was looking at, um, you know, it, certain individuals, um, certain patterns. Uh, but with comedy films, because I like comedy, yeah, it was a natural step for me to to go into comedy films because I felt like there was a huge uh, lacuna or a gap in the academic study because. Most of the scholars who look at North Korean film always focused on like these heavy ideological, like propaganda films. And they were trying to decipher what this means. I'm like, dude, let's get away from the propaganda films. Let's get into the ones that people actually enjoy. And, you know, th there are sitcoms, there are, um, you know, uh, sh uh, short films, and then th there are comedy films. And so when I when I ventured into the comedy films, man, that was some of them are hilarious, right? Um, and because comedy is pretty subversive, right? You know, comedy pushes the limits, right? Yeah. Um, North Korean comedy also, in its own way, pushes the limits of social issues, social criticism. Yeah. They never criticize the leaders. Once again, they never do that. Right. Um, so you know, these writers, they know how to push the limits without going too far. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That is really interesting. Um, what would you say is like a, the most common example then of, of sort of pushing, like, you know, talking about societal issue? Like, what's the common societal issue that people are most sort of complaining about in literature or in comedy? Hands down, it is criticizing the boss or the manager. Okay. Okay. All right. They love doing that because this is their everyday experience. They they deal with their manager at work at their workplace. Yep. They they deal with their boss and they love to uh, take a little jab at their boss, right? So uh, when they when they see that on the screen or on on TV, um, you know they they re, they relate to that uh, issue, right? Um, and some people have asked me. Well, if, if they're able to make fun of their boss, isn't it really making fun of the leaders? And I, I, I don't think so. Because, for example, um, when we watch uh, The Office with Steve Carell, right? Uh, you know, he's the bumbling fool, right? He's the idiot. Uh, you yeah. know, uh, and the joke is really on him, right? And that's where the comedy is, right? But I don't think any American would watch The Office and look at Steve Carell and say, oh, that is uh, making fun of Obama. Because I think that's when it came out, uh, right. The Office. Uh, right, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. 
So they're not going to say, oh, yeah, Steve Carell is is basically Obama, right? So uh, the show is actually making fun of Obama. I don't think any American would make that association, right? Right. So uh, I, I think the same goes for these North Korean uh, um, you know, sitcoms and uh, comedy films. Just because they make fun of the, you know, the manager or the boss doesn't necessarily mean that they're making fun of the leaders, right? Sure. Um, and I think I think making that jump um, is really a jump, right? Yeah. So, right. Yeah. So I think I think they're making fun of their middle management, the the bosses, because this is who they experience every day. Right. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. So from all of your research on North Korea and your experiences, what would you say is kind of the most surprising or interesting thing that you've learned? Uh, that they are becoming more digitized, and I'm so happy they are. So so if you watch it, you know, the comedy films that I talk about in my book man they're in the 70s and 80s uh even up to the 2000s early 2000s uh but they're all um film so they still use the old style film right um and even hollywood has sort of moved pa moved past that um south korea has certainly moved past that but if you watch north korean films they're all over youtube so if you just type in north korean films you're going to get like this grainy um, optics, uh, you know, something that is reflective of, I don't know, Hollywood's 1940s movies or something, like Gone yeah. with the Wind or something, right? Yeah. And you're thinking, man, North Korea still uses that old technology. Unfortunately, they have been, and it's really sad. However, recently, I'm talking about 2020, 2020, 2021, they finally moved over to the digital camera. And so if you watch some of the more recent films uh, from North Korea, now it looks like the ones that we're used to and what South Korea is utilizing these days, right? So finally they've made that jump and it's a very evident drop, a jump. So I'm very happy with that. And um, hopefully, you know, as they are, as, as they move over to the digital world, um, you know, hopefully the the content of the film will also change and become more, you know, concurrent uh, with what's happening around the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's the the, the, the kind of cool thing in general about your your work because it's so easy, I think, from people on the outside looking at, at different societies, especially ones with these, you know, kind of odd political views, or, you know, or very authoritarian is that you kind of just, just assume that, okay, it's like, there's nothing here. It's, it's just kind of this empty, empty shell kind of, of propaganda. Um, but, you know, in reality, there's, you know, that, I think that's just so short-sighted because there's so much you can learn and understand that can help really in the future for many things in terms of international relations, just by understanding a society and, you know, what's beyond the surface of it, because, it's a human society like everywhere else. So, yeah, you know, absolutely. And, you know, from North Korea's perspective, all they want really from the world, uh, from the US, from South Korea, from the UN, all they want is a hey, just acknowledge us as a normal country. Don't, don't like, you know, pit us or pigeonhole us as some like irrational, crazy group of people we're not um and you know they try to they try to tell the world that they're just as normal as the person sitting next to them uh unfortunately though some of the videos that they release some yeah. of the things that they do it doesn't help with that argument right and i'm no. like you know yeah. Come on, guys! Right, you're trying to make this argument that you're normal, but that you're gonna you're gonna publicize these weird videos, and you're you know you're gonna you're gonna um, you know, show off and, and do some crazy thing. You're not helping yourself, man. I yeah. don't know if you saw their most recent uh, yes. propaganda uh, the, yeah, with the, the Top Gun version of like a missile launch. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I'm like, all right, if that's comedy, that's great comedy, right? Um, yeah. You know, otherwise, you know, it's hilarious, yeah. right? Um, 
well, I don't know yeah. how I don't know what they were thinking sending out that uh, you know video, but it's hilarious. I love it. Yeah. I love every bit of it. Yeah, I thought that was uh, one of the what I mean. You could have given that an Academy Award. You know, that was totally. Uh, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> was, but yeah, if you haven't seen it, and you're listening. You should check that out. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah but yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that's that's the big issue is because. You know, the people are the same leadership, on the other hand, in different countries that are, you know, can be pretty out of touch with reality as they often are, you know, in these correct echo chambers of authoritarianism, um, especially North Korea, I suppose. Uh, it's kind of, well, the top, top in terms of like the standard for sort of a uh, regime kookiness, but <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but the people in general are, you know, you could relate to them um, on a personal, personal level, I suppose. I mean, look, absolutely. So even my minder, who was probably selected by the party or some kind of yeah. department, uh, government department and so forth. Um, you know, when we got together and we had dinner, every, I, you know, I had lunch, dinner with this guy every day. Um, we started talking about his family, you know, his kid. Now we're getting to like real conversations. Yeah. And, you know, you realize, oh, yeah, this guy's a government official, but hey, man, you know, he's struggling to raise his teenage girl, you know, <laughs> you know it's, yeah. just, it's just like any other father, right? And, right. Um, yeah. you know, then we would share stories, we would exchange stories and things like that. Um, you know, his childhood, uh, albeit his childhood was significantly different from my childhood. Um, <laughs> But but nonetheless, some of the, uh, you know, concerns, stress, uh, whatever uh, issues and you know, problems that he faced, uh, different context, but nonetheless, similar issues. Right? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. There's a, yeah. They're human. They're human after all. Yeah, that's right. The, the human factor there. And I think that, that yeah, it's easy to lose track of. Um, because you get blinded by the by the politics of the governments, um, but yeah, the people there are pretty much just people. So, um. absolutely. You know, here's an interesting thing as well. Um, you know, I grew up in California. Yeah. And you know, someone growing up in I don't know Alabama or Maine or Alaska, although they're all Americans, I think we'll all have slightly different experiences growing yeah. up, right? But nonetheless, I mean, we're still human beings, right? So yep. uh, we could still sit down and have a sensible discussion, conversation, right? So yeah, that's exactly what I had with the North Korean guy, right? So, yeah, interesting, yeah. cool. Um, so what are you uh, currently working on? Well, with the ben pandemic, it's it was really difficult to start up a new uh, project. And, yeah. Um, you know, the Library of Congress is now just reopening, right? Yes. So, um, you know, I, well, well, we'll have to wait and see, you know, but okay. it's going to move more toward, you know, media and, uh, you know, maybe television, North okay. television programs sure. and whatnot. Yeah. So we'll see. Cool. And what's the best way for people to like keep track of your work then? Oh God. You know, I, I'm terrible with promoting myself. I, I, I don't have a Twitter account. Um, my Instagram is, I don't know, decades old and, and it's has all these cobwebs on it. Um, so it's it's hard to follow anything that I do. Um, you got your university and, page, then I suppose. Yeah, maybe my university yeah. page. That's about it. I, I'm so I'm so uh, analog when it comes to this kind of stuff. So I'm I'm sorry to your audience. No, that's that's okay. They can do the extra effort and just Google you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for doing this. It's been really interesting. I, I think. Uh, yeah, sheds light on a lot of things that I think would be pretty mysterious otherwise for people. So thanks again. Thank you, Ben, for having me. And, uh, you know, it was a pleasure talking to you.